day service. Uh, <clears throat> our announcements for today is that on Tuesday, October the 11th at 6.30, there is an Ad Council meeting. Uh, Karen, do you have anything to reflect on that? Not exactly, but the agenda to everybody that's involved should receive it by tomorrow evening. Make a copy of it to bring along. Uh, but only unless somebody has something they want to bring up, you know, that we should try to discuss. Why let me know, let you know, let Lisa know, Dale. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> On Wednesday, October the 19th at 7 p.m., there is an SPRC meeting at Christ United Methodist Church. Um, if you have been following along, um, you can watch today's service afterwards. Diane will post that. All Saints Sunday is Sunday, November the 6th. If you would like to light a candle for a loved one who has passed away since November 1, 1, 2021. There is a blue form in your bulletin. Uh, please fill it out and see to it that Lou Dennis gets it back by October the 30th. This church is still looking for a custodian. Um, you can talk to Del Morrow or Wayne Vital. Um, Newburgh Cocoa Fire Department is hosting a fire prevention open house on Saturday, October the 15th at the station located at 121 Lovers Lane, Newburgh. Uh, that is from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. and refreshments will be served and other fun activities will be available to the community <coughs> members. Are there any other announcements? Yes, I would like to ask the trustees to uh, stay after church for a brief meeting. Uh, we have a couple decisions to make on the the window replacement project that we're planning for next year. So all trustees and even anyone interested um, on the look of the window glass, uh, please join in the back after church. Did everybody hear that? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I'd just like to let you know that the pre-sermon Bible study clips are now going to be included in our weekly statistics as a small group. So uh, I'm just encouraging you to take a look at them. They are maximum 15 minutes. That's a, 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 I found out that's the maximum amount allowed. So the more views we get, the higher our numbers are on for the statistics for that small group. Thank you. Any other announcements? <laughs> if not, we'll continue with our service. <laughs> Let us worship God. 
invitation is through it all.
deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years has completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. If I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sandra. I'd like to start off this morning with a story of what I call the lesson of the lily. First, I'd like you to imagine a lily before it's bloomed, and this lily has a lot of personality. This lily has dreams for the future, and that dream particularly is to bloom in a beautiful garden on the English countryside. Instead, her bulb had been planted in a side lot of a city slum. And so she digs in her heels and she says, I refuse to bloom in such unpleasant circumstances and surroundings, and eventually gains the attention of the gardener who put her there in the first place. So he puts more water on, he, he tends to the soil and adds nutrients and, and moves some of the, the hindrances to uh, the sunlight. But the lily doesn't budge. Says again to the, uh, to the gardener, I just never saw myself in a place like this. Such an unpleasant place. I refuse to bloom here. I always dreamt of being in the beautiful, beautiful surroundings of a large garden in and on the English countryside. And so the gardener thinks about this and thinks, what can I say, what can I do to make a difference? And comes up with this to say to the lily. Think about it this way. You'd be lost in such a grand and beautiful English garden, wouldn't you? Here, you're the only thing of beauty that exists. Think of the attention that you will get when you bloom and the people see your bloom next to this drab concrete and rusty fence, especially. The next day, the gardener, as he's passing by, he noticed a small group of children gathered around that area of the side lot and walks over to see what it is that they're looking at. And sure enough, they gather around to admire the beautiful bloom of this lily in full bloom there before them. In today's passage, Jeremiah sends a letter to the Israelites in Babylon, the unsettled <coughs> exiles living there and instructs them to bloom where planted. Talk about unsettled, unhappy, discontented. Talk about having better and greater goals than this for life. The Israelites there in this city are ready to turn around and come right back home. Some of the prophets living there with them have told them, don't unpack. It won't be long. God is going to save us and bring us back to our land very quickly. But you notice in the letter, Jeremiah tells them it's not going to be quick. It's going to be 70 years. And this does not go over well. <coughs> he doesn't say what they wanted him to say. He didn't say what the false prophets were telling him. <coughs> he didn't say, be patient, don't unpack, 
This is only a bad dream. You'll be home by summer break. No. Tells them to settle in for the long haul. He tells them, in essence, stay put. When Christine and I had returned from Japan in 1994, we had lived there for several years, we were prepared to move out again onto and into a different mission field. That's what we had always imagined for ourselves. We didn't realize that the whole concept of mission field was really by that time, the mid-90s, late 90s, was coming to an end. And fewer and fewer churches were sending out missionaries like they had. And over the years, after many, many prayers went apparently unanswered, we realized that we weren't going back. That we were going to have to do just what the Israelites did there in that city of Babylon. They were, we were going to have to buy a house and settle down, plant a garden and eat what it produces, have children and so on. And especially that line about pray for the city and, and seek its prosperity so that as it prospers you do too. It's unprecedented in the ancient world to seek the prosperity of one's enemies. It's unprecedented today too, I'm sure. Jeremiah tells them through God's words that they are to pray that their enemies succeed in their endeavor because as that city succeeds, so will the Israelites who are there acting as if they were citizens. They're to settle in and put forth their best effort to be good people. They're to establish households and families, settle down, plant gardens for food, get married, have children, seek the prosperity of their captors, if you can imagine that. They are being called to assimilate in the most difficult and demanding ways. Have you ever been asked, or I should ask you, when was the last time you were asked to assimilate? When was the last time you had a new job? Everything was new. And you had to change so many things about yourself. When was the last time you moved into a new place, a new neighborhood, and had to assimilate? Most of us will make every effort to have these situations as few and far between in our minds. It's a very, very uncomfortable situation. There's a word that we use to describe what the Israelites experienced there in Babylon and what refugees and exiles and others do all over the world, even today, we call it displacement. When you're displaced, you're out of your element. You're, in essence, lost. It's not a good feeling. Literal displacement is a worldwide problem right now as people are moving, migrating. They're not in their homelands. They're moving from one place to another many of which are hoping one day to go back. Think about the Ukrainians. You know there's a very large group of Ukrainians uh, who have, in essence, migrated to Poland and lots of other places, but I've heard about Poland and the massive numbers that are there. And they have no intention of settling down. Their desire is to go back home just as quickly as possible. They're only gonna stay there. They're probably working out of their suitcases. Because as soon as they get to go, they're going to be moving back home. And I'm sure some have by now. They just want to go home. But there's another type of displacement that any one of us could feel in this room. The feeling that you're not where you should be, in essence. You're out of your element. You're unsatisfied. You feel like a stranger in a strange land. Maybe you have no political home where you feel safe. Maybe you have no work home where you feel appreciated and valued. The story of Christians down through the ages see this over and over again. There's a sense, a strong sense of displacement among our people, waiting eagerly for some kind of a homecoming. 
Have you ever felt like God was distant from you in your life? That's displacement. Most of us have felt this one time or another. And of course, we want this time to be over as soon as possible and feel like you've come home again. Many church people, especially churches in the United Methodist Church right now, feel displaced, lost, like refugees without a home. Our conference has a lot of turmoil. We have a lot of churches that are considering disaffiliation. There's a whole team designated now to hearing the, the, the complaints of the churches who are seeking disaffiliation. This has been a, a, an ongoing problem even since the 60s not being able to agree and losing more and more members in the United Methodist Church from all those years ago, migrating to other denominations or just giving up on church altogether. We're in the middle of this, I don't know, terrible thing called a paradigm shift where we lose the footing under our feet. We feel like exiles, displaced, Wondering where our Christian culture went. <clears throat> and if we're honest, we just want these days to pass so that we can all move on to better times or move back to better times where it was before the pandemic, if nothing else. We want our leaders to tell us that these days are going to be over soon and give us a day. When is it going to be over? The pandemic. When? You know, is it is it here forever? We're, we're being told that this is the new normal now. I need some brutally honest leader to say, settle in, this is the new normal. The pandemic has also made exiles of us all, wishing to return to a place that maybe doesn't exist anymore. Any one of us could feel displaced and unsettled in life right now. You know, we had our church conference the other night. During the meeting, one of the members of Christ Church asked Barry, why is it that some independent churches are growing so fast and ours isn't? Why is that? And Barry first said uh, a quick answer. He said, um, well, you have to ask them. But then I could see the wheels turning as he thought about a better answer or more helpful answer, and, and he came up with an answer that really is the title of today's sermon. While it's fine to consider why other churches are growing, you have to trust that God has a plan, and then you have to make the most of the circumstances that you're in. He actually said, bloom where you're planted, which I just thought was a real affirmation for me, for you today. And so, my best practice for you, that sermon imperative that I like to give so that we can think about what we can do if all this is true, what can we do about it in our lives today or this week or whenever? We Christians are to make the most out of the life situations in which we find ourselves, both individually and corporately. Yes, this promise that God has a plan for you to prosper you and not to harm you, yes, that is an individual promise, but all of those used in the original Hebrew, that's talking about a group of people. So just, well, that promise is for all of us as a team, as a church. God has a plan to prosper us and not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. And in the meantime, we bloom where we're planted. We love our neighbors, we serve the poor, we volunteer in church, we volunteer in society, we care for our families, we inter interact with non-church goers, we forgive one another, we raise our children, we care for our elderly parents, we long for justice, we strive for peace, we make the most out of the situation in which we find ourselves. In a sense, that is what Jesus did, and it's the good news for us today. He bloomed where he was planted here. Jesus knows what it's like to be in exile, to be displaced from his home, a stranger 
in a strange land. He was an exile here, separated, like a migrant or a refugee. Never felt truly at home. Never felt settled here. But that didn't stop him from blooming or making the most out of the situation. Didn't stop him from showing us the way by feeding the hungry and uh, giving drink to the thirsty, touching the untouchable and associating with tax collectors and sinners, all those things he did. And he did all that. He bloomed where he planted. He made the most out of the situation he found himself for our sake so that none of us would have to live in exile forever. <clears throat> that one day, there would be a grand homecoming for us as individuals, but as a church too. A welcome home, a banquet, and a grand celebration. Let us pray. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you experience displacement so that we could find our way home. You were in exile so that we could be accepted. Help us to bloom as individuals so that together we can make a beautiful garden here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are willing and able, would you please rise? We're going to sing together our hymn of response, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
You'll see on the overhead a list of some of the folks that we are praying for this day and some of the situations that we are praying for down at the bottom. I'd like you to look over those names, read them out in your head, and remember the issues that they are facing. <coughs> joys in, um, in this beautiful new day. I have a couple of joys and some updates. Thank you, Sandra. I'm going to stand up here. Um, we've had my cousin Ashley Ford on the prayer chain for quite some time now because she's a young woman with cancer. <laughs> I received um, a message from her mother uh, a few days ago. And she had her second PET scan done on 9.30. She got her results on Monday. And the PET scan showed no cancer on the lungs or liver. It's gone. And the tumor in the cervix has shrunk more since May. But the treatment will continue for the cervical cancer until it has been cured as well. So she asked that we please do not stop praying for Ashley. Um, I think Ashley is in her early 40s, um, um, and several have asked about Robert, and uh, Robert's doing uh, considerably a lot better than what he has been doing. Um, he still has a few areas to rise above. Um, he's still uh, having problems with pain in his back and hip and um, a muscle. And so I ask that you continue to pray for him. And I have spoken with my aunt several times, and she is still struggling. But uh, she's a good Christian, and she prays every day and reads her Bible. And, and uh, she knows that prayers is helping her through this struggle that she's going through. So, And I have a joy. I gained a grandson-in-law last Saturday, our granddaughter, Emmy Piper, married Trevor Brenneyes. So she is a Brenneyes partner now, and Trevor is Paul Brenneyes' grandson. <clears throat> and it was beautiful, even though it rained. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we come with heavy hearts this day as we do at any time in our lives and can at any time in our lives as so many concerns seem to weigh upon us for family, for friends. 
We ask you, God, for your healing in ways that we can understand. For Ray, for Sandra, for Ashley, Robert. Lord, we thank you, God, for the good things that you're doing in this world. We thank you for uh, awards and good work in college. We pray for our young people who are preparing to make a difference in this world in a few years. That your blessing will be upon college students right now in this precarious situation. And Lord, for those times when we run out of words to say, when we lose our, when we lose our thoughts and we come before you with nothing but concerns and nothing, no way to express them, we thank you, God, for the words that Jesus has taught us. We pray together those words from the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven,
grace and love that flows so freely from God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord with gladness. And we'll see you next week. Amen.